All right. How many different time zones are we in right now? I want to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, but I'm not sure. Uh, East Coast time zone? Sort of. European time zone? I'm just going to generalize. APAC time zone? Oh, nobody. All right, so everyone should be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. There's no issues whatsoever with falling asleep, except for food coma. Does everyone need an espresso break by any chance? Just a quick jaunt. We have a few minutes. All right, we're good to go. Um, so I was tasked with the topic of data transformations and fatigue, <laughs> something that I think will resonate with all of us. Uh, whether you're an entrepreneur, an executive, you just started your own business, or you're an IC, I think we can all relate to having to push features and functionality into productions, running and managing these transformations, going fast and heavy in what I call flying a plane while building it at the same time. So you're building a product while selling its potential and the art of the possible at the same time. But fatigue is legitimately a real thing. And so what I wanted to do was give a little bit of an introduction um, to myself because I have no credibility amongst this group whatsoever. <laughs> I stepped into this and I was like, oh crap, everyone knows each other. I think I know five of you guys, unfortunately. But the good news is, is that I'm going along and meeting Paul and Chris and Hugo and the rest of the gang. There's no doubt that you guys are brilliant individuals. Um, I am not one of you. <laughs> I uh, started my career very, very differently. Interestingly enough, um, I do live in Miami, very different climate. I moved there seven years ago to start the tech scene there. I was given a phenomenal opportunity. When I say tech scene, I mean non-NFT, non-crypto, and non-OnlyFans. I mean like <laughs> real tech, tech, tech. <laughs> Sometimes I have to make the distinction between the two because Miami can get a little bit creepy at times. Um, and, and that line gets really blurred. But um, I did not study applied mathematics. I was a chemical engineer and I wanted nothing to do with chemistry or engineering when I graduated. Uh, I actually played rugby and thought I was gonna play professional sports my entire life. I was on the US women's rugby team until my 20s. And then I realized that as you age, you don't quite recover as quickly. <laughs> and that could be a night out of drinking. That could be a day of snowboarding. That could be a really hard workout. The problem is, is as you age, things just take a lot longer. And so I had to actually make a choice of do I continue with professional sports or do I become a professional? And I decided to become a professional. So I took the one job that no one wanted and that was to be a data engineer. That was my first job uh, into the real world. And I personally loved it, but my fellow peers actually told me I'm never allowed to touch a lick of code again. But I was amazing at talking, apparently. And so oddly enough, things sort of translate in a really weird way because I sat with the engineers. We were the dorks in the cubicles trying to solve the problems using Cognos and MicroStrategy and, and writing the, the scripts you know, for their data pipelines from scratch. But no one wanted to talk to the business and the business couldn't talk to the engineers. So I played this weird translator role in between and I was this gopher that was going back and forth. I would take the work that we did, present it to the executives, they would tell me that, okay, this is great, we want more of this, can you find this out? And then I would take the work back to our data engineers, we'd go through the analysis and processing problem, and then things just sort of naturally took off. And in an odd way, I found my niche. Um, I left data engineering to become a master data management expert. How many of you guys are still familiar with MDM? I was an SAP Platinum consultant. No one teaches you more about how fucked up business processes are <laughs> than the art of MDM. So it's not really a data job, it's actually a business job. Um, and I remember that at some point in time with an IBM, which is where things really happened, I gave the client two options. I said, you literally only have two options. You can give me enough budget so that I can buy all the pails in the world and I can catch the leak from the faucet or you can give me enough budget so I can figure out where the leak in the faucet is happening and give me the authority to fix it. Because if I do not have the authority to fix that business problem, you're just gonna have to give me enough budget to deal with the leaky faucet time in and time out again. And I'm like, the option is completely yours, I'm willing to do both. And then naturally, uh, through the storytelling, one thing led to another, uh, Watson, in 2011 was launched. I helped them launch Watson for good or for bad. We learned a lot of things from that. I was there during the rise and demise. And then I left to become partner at Ernst & Young, part of their digital practice. And then oddly enough, in 2016, I became the chief data and AI officer for Royal Caribbean. Back when 
the word was still respected. <laughs> the role was still respected. It was new, it was shiny. You had absolutely no idea what you were getting yourself into. Um, and then the shit storm hit and I'll walk you guys through what the shit storm looked like. But long story short, I've had some amazing roles. It's been very fruitful, very tiring. Um, and then last year in June, I officially retired from corporate America. And so now it's like a year of exploration and saying yes. And oddly enough, I'm helping a lot of startups create their enterprise playbook because a lot of the founders and entrepreneurs that I've met are brilliant engineers and data scientists, but they don't know how to commercialize their product necessarily. Um, I know the corporate world very, very well. So I take the problems that entrepreneurs are solving and build the, help them build the enterprise playbook so that they have a better chance of succeeding of what it is that they do with the bigger players in a different language that they can actually understand. So we'll see what happens, but it's an experimental year. Um, out of curiosity, and we're gonna get to a next slide, how many of you guys have done a data transformation end to end? Okay, keep your hands up. As keep your hands up if part of an enterprise or a corporation, like large. All right, may I ask what year? What year was the transformation? Yeah, what year did you do it? 2018, okay. 2015, ooh, you were one of the early ones. All right, yes. 2016? Oh, Chris, yes. Woohoo! You the oh, you're the goat of data transformations. <laughs> Oh, uh, when? Wait, but are we talking about ERP deployments or true data transformations where we want literacy, change management, data is an asset, new oil, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, the crown goes to him. He's the goat. <laughs> Regardless of what your definition is, there's just some fundamental principles and components that go into it. And... I won't have to read this for you, you guys understand. Um, the premise is great. I always say the inspiration behind it is fantastic. But there is a big divide between the inspiration of changing and the perspiration of requiring, of the requirements to make the change. And that is where I think things get really sticky. Um, the first lesson that I learned was not all transformations are equal. Digital transformation takes a different shape than a data transformation, which takes a different shape than other transformations. I think the second is, is depending on your role, your experience in that transition and the level of fatigue that you experience will be unique to you. Um, and we'll get into some of those. But just another show of hands, how many of you guys are current individual contributors within an organization, a startup, whatever it may be? Okay. And have you guys gone through a full transformation or are in the midst of it out of curiosity? Okay, so sort of. All right. Um, how many of you guys are a team lead within a company? You manage the engineering team, data science team. What function, may I ask? What group? Mm -hmm. The data engineers? OK. May I ask what function? Yeah? Product managers. OK, wonderful. Do we have a few more team leads here? All right, head of data. Fun times. Um, and I put leader in question mark because we're all leaders. Yes, I know. It's not to exclude anyone. But it's the person who ultimately holds the budget is an accountable for delivering on time, on budget, et cetera. How many of you guys play that role? Okay. So some of the weight falls on you as well for delivery and accountability. And then the last, how many of you guys are founders and entrepreneurs? Okay. I'm asking these questions because we're going to go through a series of slides slides. And another raise of hands. How many of you guys have felt the fatigue and are recovering from it? Or you're in the midst of it right now because you're pulling your 80 to 100 hours a week? Okay, so, all right. Everyone should keep their hands up because if not, <laughs> this isn't a conversation for you. <laughs> all right. How many of you guys are experiencing the fatigue right now? How many hours are you putting in? Too many, too many. How many? How many hours are you putting in? Yeah? Okay. You're, you're in the thick of it. <laughs> all right. So let's go through. When I was mentioning that not all transformations are equal, and I'm not going to say one is easier than the other, but I think that there is a unique aspect with data. 
Because when you go through a digital transformation, it is really around digitizing processes. And nowadays, companies are defining it as very commerce focused. When you're going through an AI transformation, I don't even know how long that phase is going to last, to be honest with you, because they don't even have the data ecosystem in place. So quite frankly, they're always going to be limited with how far they can take the user experience and the capabilities. And nowadays, I'm being pulled in, and I'm helping a few Fortune 50s with their AI strategy. And the first thing I ask is, can I take a look at your data strategy? You can't have one without the other. And they're like, ah, uh, ooh, e, ah. Uh. And then sometimes I talk to the CIO, and it's enterprise architecture team walking me through <laughs> their application architecture. I'm like, that is not a data st strategy. Data architecture is different than enterprise architecture. What is your full-blown data strategy? And oftentimes, there's bits and pieces of it, but it hasn't come together in a straight cohesion. So the AI strategy actually evolves into a parallel data strategy path, because you, you guys know you can't do one without the other. There is an operational transformation. The beauty of that is that is not led by us. That is mostly led by the business because they realize how inefficient their business processes are, which is the root cause of behind of many of the things that we have fundamentally have to fix. And then the last one is all the modernization of the tech stack. But there's one thing that they all have in common, and that it, you can't do a single transformation without the business. And this is where our issues come about. Oftentimes they're overworked. They have PL pressures. They don't understand our language. They don't understand our lingo. And the worst is they have 14 other strategic priorities, and your transformation became the 15th strategic priority. How on earth do they have enough resources, time, capacity, bandwidth to be able to focus on you, everything else they need to do, in addition to running the business and driving the PL? It's nearly impossible. So for us, it's a big major point because we're like, they're not paying attention, they don't understand. I've learned to have empathy for them, only because if I were in their shoes, I don't even know if I'd have enough capacity to deal and understand the root causes behind things, which is why sometimes when you have the conversations, they're gonna delegate to another person, then another person, then another person. And before you know it, you're delegated to a person that has no influence or authority or budget, but they're the only one that understands what's broken. So you gotta work all the way down the chain, only to work back all the way up the chain. So it's definitely an exercise in patience for sure. But when it comes to data transformations, there's something very unique and very specific. I created this uh, for one of my roles. And I said, what does that even mean? Because our world, data is something that everyone and no one owns at the same time. And my running joke is, when's the last time you all flushed the toilet and called your plumber and said thank you? You don't. It's a service that's expected. When's the last time you flipped a light switch on and you called your electrician and you said, thank you. You don't, it's a service that's expected. And unfortunately in the data world, it's a service that's expected. It's commodity based, even though it's fundamental to everything any company does. And half the time they don't even recognize it and that's the worst part of it. So it really is a basis, but data is not a word. There's so many different components. So when I was hired as a chief data officer during my interviews, I'm like, well, do you guys have an idea of scope? What are the capabilities that are lacking? What are you trying to do? And I would hear these big buzzword, well, we're trying to be data driven. If I hear that again, my PTSD is gonna kick in big time. Uh, we wanna monetize on data. If I hear that again, PTSD is gonna kick in. Um, we need to increase our data literacy. You guys have heard all the jargon before. So they come up with these big brushstroke terms without even understanding what the heck it means. So CDOs were originally hired as the primary translators behind these aspirations so that we could actually quantify the perspiration that's gonna be needed to be able to actually pivot and help evolve. But the challenge is, what do you guys see in common amongst these 16 facets? We don't own it all. So, if I'm responsible for master data management or a migration from ECC to S4 HANA, do I have full control and decision-making rights on that? I have to connect and collaborate with how many other teams? That creates drag, drag creates fatigue. Or if I take a look at the CRM CDP systems, we don't own that either in the data space. We have to work with the business, we have to work with IT, we have to work with the compliance, we have to work with risk, we have to work with PII, now we have to pull it InfoSec. That creates drag, which creates fatigue. It doesn't matter what it is that you're trying to do. There is fundamentally always a dependency on other teams, other functions, um, and they're not all driven the way we are. They can't see what we can see. And sometimes half the battle 
is articulating what it is that we see, how something should be, not how something is right now. And so that art of storytelling, your ability to narrate is super, super important because you now have a dependency on many other groups, many other teams, many other functions, and you want to go 100 miles an hour, they're going 30, 40. So there's an element of pace that I don't think folks understand but really amplifies the fatigue level because you want to go what naturally makes sense to you and you're not allowed to. And the worst part is, is I think the role of a CDO is very glamorous. It sounds glamorous. It's not. It's a shit job. Um, <laughs> in some cases, you have full autonomy, which is fantastic. I've learned to negotiate those. But in others, I'm trying to democratize data. Have you guys heard of that term? Right. What is democratization? Something so simple in concept really mean. Okay, let's democratize data. People want access to more data. The old school way of doing it is an analyst has to get permission from a data set. That data set exists, exists within an application. They have to go to the application lead to get permission. That person doesn't want to get fired, so then they have to go and get permission to understand if the analyst can get the access to the data set. They might, likely aren't going to build an integration for you, so then they have to do some sort of batch job or FTB drop so that you can get that. But then you need real time, so then now you've got to wait until they can give you the next file, and the circle goes on and on and on. So the notion of data democratization, democratization is very easy, but to do it well and to do it right requires, and I'm gonna give you an example. I just did this for Estee Lauder. Um, I have to work with HR, and I have to understand within our entire organization, who is tagged as a data and analytics resource? What are their titles? What are their levels? What are the jobs that they do? Do you think that information is organized or like Neatly, nicely, no. And HR is usually working in an HR, I'm sorry, in Excel, because they don't have the budget for any of the great tools. So we gotta go through all their Excel spreadsheets, they've gotta hit their HR reps only to go through their business processes and val validate. How many analysts do you have in your organization and what are they called? We then come back with an assessment and go, okay, of the 432 people we found, only 250 are really in the DNA space and of the 250, 100 should really have access to this data set. Well, then you gotta go through and classify the data set. What should be democratized and what can't be because it's confidential and sensitive. Then you have to connect with the Active Directory. Then from there, you have to do, connect with Cloud Ops. Well, this little notion of data democratization has now taken 10 months of just back-end processing work so that you can give the right people the right data at the right time. The problem is, is when you work for an enterprise and there's 150,000 employees, you're putting in all this effort to give 102 people access. Is it worth it? But it's the number one thing people complain about. This is where fatigue sets in. In the four positions, and of those 16 facets, I've had different responsibilities for each one. Do you guys remember back in 2015, 16, 360 view of a customer was, was the thing that was discussed? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> To 720 degrees, that's right, that's right. I'm fortunate, I haven't heard of it too much anymore, um, but just even that simple concept, like data democratization. Well, at Royal Caribbean, we had 76 different source systems that house customer data. And my CEO was like, we want it all centralized so that we can do analysis, understand preferences, and we can start working our way towards personalization. Well, of the 76, we found that only 21 really mattered. The rest was kind of crap and no one was gonna use it. We built the data lake, we built three zones, different consumption patterns. One zone was for data scientists, another zone was for data analysts, and another one, curated semantic layers were for business analysts. You guys have done this. Again, only to have how many people you actually use it to go through all that effort, because very few people actually know how to model the data. And when you introduce new data sets to them, more is not always better, because they don't know how to, ex like how to actually do the joins. So we realize that even when you provide more data, the business actually doesn't know how to use more data. So by the time I had that scope, and by the time I left Estee Lauder, my approach towards data aggregations and centralizations and building lakes had completely changed. And my running joke is if I never have to build a semantic layer, which is a consistently moving target for the rest of my life, I will be a happy camper. So if I can avoid it at all costs, I absolutely will. But there's something to be learned here. It's not a therapy session for me, so I do apologize. It's coming across one way. <laughs> But if, if you guys want to talk to me, let me know what you're going through right now. But in the process, I have learned a few things about setting expectations for anyone I hire, setting expectations for anyone that's going to start a business of their own, setting expectations for a startup about to become a scale-up, setting expectations of, 
Our space is very difficult, and I say that sometimes you need a backbone and not a wishbone. It requires stamina. It requires stubbornness. It does require a love for the space. It chooses you, you don't choose it, and it is not an easy path. I've never done a transformation that took less than two years, two to five years. But what's the issue with that? There's a fundamental flaw in driving a transformation. It takes you three to six months to align the scope, the teams, the budget, minimum. You start requirements, you start design, you're about a year and a half in. Two years, you actually start developing and you're putting some MVPs out there. The entire tech stack changes from underneath you. So if you are an environment, a corporate culture that's slow and deliberate, legacy-based, so they have to measure three times before they cut once, by the time you even launch the transformation, the rug has been pulled underneath you and you've got to redo your entire architecture and approaches of how you're going to consume and provide information. So there, it, there is a flaw in, inherently in how transformations are done. The second is around scope. Nothing sticks. Nothing stays still. Because sometimes we make assumptions and they hold true or they don't. Other times you think you're solving for one problem only to find out that a business process is broken or not even in place. So now you have to fix a business process. I'll give you an example. It was post-COVID. I had just joined Estee Lauder. Well, we were all wearing masks. No one was wearing makeup. But then all of a sudden when the mask started coming out, TikTok had all the rage. It was called the summer of love. And there were these two colors, bright pink and orange. That's what I called them. But it was like poppy seed and persimmon. I've never found so many different ways of coloring, to, like just naming colors. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell are poppy seed and persimmon? They're like, oh, it's pink and orange. Why aren't we calling it pink and orange? Well, no, there's 50 different shades of pink and 40 different shades of orange. I'm like, okay. So I was like, let's run a digital campaign. Very simple concept. Let's go through TikTok, figure out the virality of the colors. Uh, that are really hitting it big. Let's figure out what within our product portfolio has those colors, and then let's market the hell out of it so that we could run the tidal wave of every viral uh, message that was going out there. Several issues. We don't track color as a master data attribution. And it's in an Excel spreadsheet sitting on a marketer's laptop in a brand, in a region, in a market. And what a market may call persimmon is not what another market calls persimmon. Okay, so let's say we solve for the color thing. What's next? We don't do a good job with our SKU definitions of what is an active product, a product in retirement, a product about to be retired, and a product that is already retired. So now you gotta go through and cleanse that data all to simply run a digital campaign on a color called Persimmon. And so I ended up, I was voluntold <laughs> that I now need to initiate a PIM project. Have any of you guys gone through a PIM project? Yeah, it's, not, it's painful. Just so I could do digital marketing campaigns better. And therein lies the crux of our story. We are not broken. It's we're fixing other people's broken problems. <laughs> and that is why things take forever. And that is where fatigue kicks in. Now, stakeholders, if you have someone, let's say you built a relationship in a company, they may change roles, they may change jobs, they may get disengaged, and you've put a lot of weight on them. That's an expectation. It will always be fluid and change. Business value. Where's Matt? Matt, are you there? <laughs> He's working on how to, you know, what does business value mean? How do you define business value? I will never pick a use case in my entire life based on business value because that is unrealistic. It may have great business value, but what's business value to the head of manufacturing is different than the business value for a head of a brand, which is different than business value for someone who runs a region. You're not, you're not the negotiator here. You're not supposed to be in that position. And it also means, even if it has high business value, the feasibility to actually deploy it based on existing infrastructure may or may not be possible. So do you want to take on a PIM project so you can run a digital campaign, or do you want to do something that's feasible in the next three months? You want to do something that's feasible in the next three months so you build your credibility on some quick wins. Literacy, this is one of my favorite. No one cares. I hate to say it. It's just the sad reality. You're going to get folks like us who are very, very passionate, but in the majority of the organizations, they don't want self-service analytics. They just want you to do it for them. So I've learned most of the things that I have built for the enterprise has actually been for my own team. 
because they're going to come to us with an email saying, I need this anyway. So it actually makes us go faster. So my approach has changed. I provide self-service, but for my team and anyone that's low code, no code, or high code, but I do not chase the brands or the businesses anymore because they're just going to send us an email anyway. So instead of taking three months to produce something, I want to take two days to do it. So that approach changed. Um, focus and funding and attention span. No matter where you go, especially if you're selling your product or service, that's an uphill battle. You need stamina. You need patience. You need just sheer stubbornness. The cloud will dissipate eventually, but you got to stick with it. And then fumbles. Mistakes. I've made a lot. Too much too soon. I think all of us know this around product development. We need this feature. We need that feature. We need this function. The fact of the matter is, is you got to keep it simple. Go to market with something, a thing, sell what it's going to be, but release what you can actually do right now. You got to keep it simple because I also know a lot of entrepreneurs that spend all their VC money on building the product and very little on sales and marketing, only to find out that they built a Ferrari, but they have no customers to buy it. So balance sales and marketing. I know it's the soft stuff. Don't ignore it. Stakeholder, I hate to say this, you got to chase the person with the most influence. Pure and simple. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing something for six, seven, eight months. Um, and then strategy. You've got very strong people dependencies on strategy, talent, and change management. Um, I realize that when you're developing something, the design and the development and the release is actually the easy part. Or once you've sold something, I hate to say it, that's the easy part. Once it's in the hands of the users, the communication, the training, the adoption, the stickiness, that is stuff that you have to be in their face on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, it will not land and it will not integrate within their businesses, which is ultimately what you want. It is 100% about FaceTime. But if you have 10 strategic priorities and you're managing 14 different functions, how do you take care of that one client when you're trying to sell to six other clients? So in this end-to-end -end plan and in these transformations, I put all the focus and energy on creating the capabilities. I put some energy in after they were built and deployed, but the ones that were successful were the ones where I handheld every brand or every region or every market. Because it's once you give them something to play with, that's when the interoperability begins. Otherwise, it becomes a shiny new toy and then they throw it away after three months. And you don't want all that blood, sweat, and tears to be thrown away after a few months. Now, Roles and fatigue. I was an IC, I was a data engineer, a horrible one, but I was one. Um, common experiences, you're gonna ask yourself, is it worth it? <laughs> Why are we doing this again? Feels like requirements are changing all the time. Are we taking shortcuts everywhere? This isn't what I signed up for. I'm tired of these long deadlines or these long days and deadlines that are just fictitiously made because an executive said so. Lots of defects, backlogs, bugs to deal with. Um, we better go public, <laughs> this better be worth it. <laughs> normal, just normal feelings to have. As a team lead, your feelings are gonna be a little bit different. You're constantly shifting between player and coach modality. You're an individual contributor, but you're also a problem solver. Your executive is gonna come to you, your leader, your CEO is gonna come to you, and they're gonna like, why isn't this done? So you have to not only get the work done, but answer why it is or is not done yet. And what you're feeling is, you can have 12 meetings in the day, but you're constantly flip-flopping from topics to audiences to problem solving to value creation only to go back and do it again. Team leads have a very difficult task in the sense that they're still developing their muscles to oscillate the different types of talks and audiences because it's not one language to a single person. Because the way you talk to your boss is gonna be different than the way you talk to your team. And the way you talk to your client is gonna be different than the way you talk to their VP of enterprise data. And you've got to learn the language of each of the groups that you communicate with, and you're not an expert yet as a team lead. So this is gonna be a struggle point. Um, it's also the first time you have both technical accountability and business accountability. So if your PMO skills aren't there, that's something that you have to learn. I know we talk in terms of sprint languages, I totally get it. But how many of you guys have had to go through, how many of you have had the role of a team lead without having the business accountability of budget? T hands up. It's a stretch the first time you're doing it because you go from just building something really cool to now being accountable for deadlines and timelines, but there's something conflicting in between because you wanna build something great, 
but sometimes you have to settle for progress over perfection. And like for some of us, that kind of hurts us at the core because we have to release something that we know isn't perfect, but because we have a deadline, we have to put it out there anyway. My favorite one is, am I getting paid enough for this shit? <laughs> I hear that all the time from my team leads. <laughs> this better work. <laughs> Um, and then if you're a leader, it's a totally different set of pressures. A completely different set. They brought you in for the transformation. Why are you still having to sell internally? Why are you spending 60% of your time selling and aligning and convincing and visualizing something that they can't see but is just so clearly set in your mind? It just never made sense to me. Um, the, you guys may not experience this, but in a lot of enterprises, there are certain industries, whether it be legal, insurance, transportation, telco, and forgive me if you come from those industries. Um, before I take a position, I actually ask, what's the average tenureship of the employee? Do you guys know why? It gives me a barometer for how complacent they are. Because if the average tenureship of an employee is 22 years, my next question is, is do you guys offer a pension fund? I learned that in pharmaceuticals. I did not last at Merck very long. I, l I left after a year, because they're not there for the right reasons. Merck still offers a pension fund. Why would anyone innovate? Why would anyone rock the boat? They check in at 916, and they clock out at 453. They're getting paid, and all they have to do is ride this wave until the pension kicks in. That is fundamentally conflicting to what we are trying to do. And that's just the reality of it. So sometimes it's not about the really cool thing you're building. You also have to pick and choose who you're selling to and who you're building for. And if there's a chance in hell that they're going to adopt and embrace it because of the natural archetype that's embedded within the corporation. This is where you have to lean less on your IQ and more on your EQ. And then when you start asking the questions, is it worth it? You'll start getting some of the answers. The other thing is, is I think as a leader, and I don't know if ICs or team leads realize this, but your CEO, your leadership team, your executive takes a lot of arrows in the back for you guys, and you may not see all the arrows because it's their job. Their job is to keep you guys motivated and to keep the morale there. If they're a good one, there's some shitty leaders out there, we've worked for them all, but they are taking a lot of arrows in the back. So I think there needs to be an understanding of what's happening to the left side and to the right side because everyone's getting hit in one way or another and they're managing it in different ways. Um, I'll let you guys read through the rest, but how to avoid fatigue. This may work for you guys, this may not. I am naturally biased towards action. I'm a very, very impatient person. So if someone says it's going to take four years, I'm like, we're doing it in two. If someone says it can't be done, I don't accept no, I go with how. And I have gone toe to toe with many chief compliance officers, and I'm like, you are stopping, you are literally responsible for slowing down the progression, the evolution of this company. Because now I can't change a tire even if I have a flat because you've screwed on the bolts so damn tight. <laughs> I can't even change a spare tire. So either we solve this problem amongst us or we're gonna have to take it to the EZ because we need to evolve. So we've gotta figure out what our risk exposure is and what we're willing to tolerate, but you're responsible for that. So when I say pace myself, part of it is to let you know that I've not been very good at this, but I've, I've learned. I've learned, I'm getting better. But when I do my forecasting, you guys choose if you want to adopt this or not. I will take a look at, remember the 16 facets? Everything I'm responsible for deploying. I'll take a look at the team either I inherited or the team that I have to build. And I'll go through my normal project timeline, and I'll go through my forecasting. If it's a new capability, like if I'm doing, I've been doing AI deployment since 2011. I still have about 16 of the 31 things I've deployed in operation still. So I can forecast, I know how things take. But if AI is new, or if data is new, or whatever product you're selling or what you've created is new, I immediately add 30% as part of the total timeline for the learning curve aperture. I don't shortcut it, that's just the reality of things. And then from there, I add an amplification effect for the corporate culture. If they are measure three times, cut once, you add 50% on top of that. But if they are, fairly recent, decent in making decisions and moving forward, you're good to go. You don't need to add any more amplification effect. And then the personal pace. If you're an individual that also needs to measure three times before you cut, you're slow, you're deliberate, it takes you time to process, 
you got to add your own personal pace to it and add another 30% on top of the timeline. I'm not that. I take away 30% from the timeline. I can take in information, process very quickly, be very decisive, and I don't want to revisit my decisions ever again. Unless we now know that assumptions have changed. Um, so this for me is a formula when I'm realistically giving a timeline to a company, and it's a formula for me to understand how long it's going to take so I can pace myself and not experience burnout. Something you guys are going to have to use with your teams eventually. The second is really how to avoid fatigue. I call it micro wins. It doesn't matter. If you're managing a team, running a team, building a team, selling to a client, you've got 10 users it. Celebrate every victory. Don't skip. The work will always be there. I've made this mistake, and I'm not saying don't repeat what I do. Repeat this, it's fine. But take credit for what you guys have done and celebrate every macro win, because everything matters at this point in time. The third one is build your tribe. Um, maybe we should have couches instead of chairs next time and you guys can talk <laughs> and express the gripes that you've had. But like friends and family, the community and the people you surround yourself with will really help you level up, but will also help flatline some of the peaks and lows that you guys are going to experience as you're going through this journey. If you don't have that tribe, find them immediately. They really do help. Um, I learned this mistake as well. If there's anyone on your team, if there's anyone you're working with that just doesn't get it, you've given them the benefit of the doubt, you've spent time with them, you've done the right humane things, and they still don't get it. You've coached them, you've mentored them, you've sent them to conferences, and they still show up uninspired, I say mediocre, you have to make the decision. Because that one person will impact every other person in your team. The biggest team I've ever managed was 832 people globally. The smallest team I've ever managed was 150 people. This one bad apple, doesn't matter how big the team, it permeates. And I hate even having this conversation, but it, you, could put, you can do everything right. But sometimes it won't work and you wonder why. So who you surround yourself with and who you surround your team with is going to be very, very critical. And it will help with the fatigue. It'll make everything worth it. And then lastly, this is a horrific picture, by the way. Look at the poor girl's leg. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's not right. <laughs> it's not right. Um, whether it's building a company or driving a transformation, there are virtues that are consistent throughout. Stamina, patience, Resiliency, um, you can't skip those. And if you're just not that person, I think you have to have an honest dialogue with yourself and go, is this really what I want to be doing? Being in the data space and the data field is hard enough as it is. Working with individuals who don't get your space is hard enough as it is. But knowing the long hours and the labor and the personality traits and virtues, you've now stacked up <laughs> three different layers. right? So you have to be honest with yourself. Are you cut out for this field or not? Um, so with that said, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm around if you guys have any questions. I've done this quite a few times, and yeah, there you go. Thank you guys.